let's recap what we have um, done so far this week. Uh, we have defined reliability. We have uh, discussed what makes a system reliability problem uh, in terms of the elements. We have looked uh, at how to set up a problem in reliability uh, and how to represent uh, a system in terms of its elements. Uh, we have also come across uh, the term redundancy a few times. So what is redundancy? Uh, everybody agrees that a system is non-redundant uh, if the failure of any one element is tantamount to system failure. Uh, thus, a series system is a non-redundant system. Uh, everybody also agrees that a system should be redundant as much as possible and a non-redundant system is a bad design and should be avoided as far as practicable. Uh, the greatest machine that we carry around ourselves all the time, uh, the human body, is an incredibly well-designed system uh, and many, many redundancies and self-healing features are built into it. There are very few single points of failure in that system. Uh, in contrast, consider the, uh, the Ronan point uh, failure that we discussed or the recent Boeing 737 MAX crashes uh, in October 2018 and March of 2019. These were glaring single point of failures uh, allowed in these designs and these failures happened almost as soon as the systems were pressed into service. So it is good to have redundancy. Uh, a redundant system has more elements than necessary for normal functioning. Everyone agrees on that point, but opinions diverge as to how redundant a system is. That is, if I have two different systems, uh, two different system architectures proposed for the same purpose, uh, what would let me say that one is more redundant than the other? Uh, just having more elements uh, is not enough. Uh, a structural system is a good model uh, that allows one to study these difficult questions. Uh, we need to consider how the elements are interacting, how the surviving elements uh, pick up the demand once failure happens in one or more elements, uh, how failure progresses once an element fails, um, we are going to look later uh, at a very instructive example uh, provided uh, by Liu and Moses, uh, where a girder bridge, uh, because of over-optimization in member sizing, uh, loses all structural redundancy uh, and ends up with a system reliability equal to that of the critical girder. So, um, but now let us look at uh, the different types of the different types of redundancy that are normally uh, defined in reliability uh, textbooks uh, and uh, look at uh, the, the different types. So we broadly have uh, two kinds of redundancy, uh, standby redundancy and, um, and active redundancy. So um, let's first define active redundancy. Uh, an active redundancy is basically all elements are loaded uh, to the full extent uh, and there could be um, in general it's, it's k out of n redundancy so k or more units must work out of n active units uh, k equals 1 implies uh, the classical parallel system and k equals n implies the classical series system uh, obviously, uh, we know from structures that uh, these K units that's, that must work are not interchangeable in most situations. So we need to also specify which K these are, even if um, you know it's a K out of N type active redundancy. Um, the this active redundancy uh, can come packaged with load sharing uh, by surviving elements uh, or no load sharing among surviving elements. So there are two different types of models that we can pick up. 
For the second case, that there's no load sharing, we have the binomial modeling uh, that we have actually done once or twice so far in this course, or uh, it can be a death process modeling, uh, which we probably will not have time to do in this course. Uh, let's move on to standby redundancy. Uh, there are two kinds, cold standby or warm standby. In contrast, active redundancy is sometimes called hot standby. So uh, in, in cold and warm standby, let's look at them one by one. So in cold standby, uh, the standby units just cannot fail. That's how they are defined uh, before they become active. So they are completely offline. Um, in simple standby redundancy, you have one active unit and n minus one spares. Uh, and this is a, a very good example of a repairable system that we talked about uh, with instant replacement. Uh, there could You can generalize that to k out of n standby redundancy, so in which there are uh, k active units and n minus k spares, uh, and there are exactly k active units at any given time. Uh, one problem that uh, classically is associated with cold standby is switching failure, and we have uh, given one example uh, for that. Um, so that happens when you bring in a, a cold uh, standby online, it might not come uh, online because of switching failure. Uh, in worm standby, uh, there are, uh, in addition to the, the active units, uh, there are on-duty units. And the remaining are standby units, which are not online. So uh, these on-duty units are lightly loaded. They are uh, partially loaded, just ready to come back online if necessary, but they are not cold. Uh, they can fail during the on-duty stage, uh, but because they are lightly loaded, that is at a much lower rate. Uh, they need to have some kind of inputs necessary, so that requires some additional uh, work on part of the designer and the system. Uh, an example that you see on the screen involves uh, a backup computer uh, in a guidance system, uh, and because the L uh, on duty units are lightly loaded, uh, switching failure is typically not a uh, concern. So um, uh, now we have discussed this just now, but let's try to put things together uh, that um, how is how is redundancy uh, you know uh, not as much as it uh, might seem uh, at first glance. So uh, factors that reduce uh, the benefit of redundancy or additional members uh, uh, for active systems, it could be common mode failure, it could be load sharing, uh, or um, for, for standby systems, uh, it could be due to switching failure, or even failure of standby units before they come online, and some amount of common mode failure also. Uh, here are examples of just how uh, we have different configurations involving the same two elements. I could have them in series, which we have already seen. I could have them in parallel, active parallel, which also we have seen. And now here is a standby parallel with a switch. So uh, at any given time, one is uh, loaded. Uh, so when both are, when none has failed, so two is on standby, one is active, and when one fails, then uh, the switch comes on and two is put into service. Uh, let's look at the example that I mentioned uh, earlier in this segment uh, involving um, a highway girder bridge reliability. So let's say uh, there are six girders uh, and uh, they, are, um, they are all of the same dimensions. Uh, and uh, the analysis uh, uh, of, of loads uh, and strengths uh, gives us the most critical girder to have a reliability index of 3.5. So we haven't defined reliability index yet, which uh, we will soon, um, the week after next. Uh, but this is a very popular measure of reliability uh, in structural engineering. Uh, 
uh, for example, a, a beta uh, of about three uh, corresponds to uh, reliability of 0 0.999. Obviously, it's a nonlinear scale involving the, the normal distribution function, but uh, let's say for now that you know 3.5 is a typical reliability that we see for uh, structural elements. Uh, the system reliability is very, very high, um, 8.0, the, the beta is 8.0, and that's because um, there are there's enough reserve strength in the remaining members uh, so that even if one fails, then they can take up the slack and so on and so forth. Um, if you want to optimize the design a little more and spend less money, then uh, one option was proposed. So there would be four girders instead of six, maybe each of them a little larger than in the previous um, option. Uh, and here also the critical girder has a beta of 3.5. The system reliability comes down from eight to five, but it's still high enough, so uh, there's no cause for concern. But now, if the design, if the, if the designer becomes over enthusiastic uh, and tries to uh, optimize the design even further, then uh, what we lose is that even if the system appears to be redundant geometrically, uh, it really doesn't have uh, any uh, extra any reserve load carrying capacity. If the solution starts looking like this. So uh, they are optimized to the last degree and um, so they are of unequal uh, dimensions. The critical girder still has a beta of 3.5 but as soon as it fails the others are also, they were already loaded to the maximum so they don't have any reserve strength. So the system reliability is still uh, the same as that of the critical element. So there is no Benefit so uh, appearance redundancy does not necessarily mean that uh, the system uh, will perform even if one or more elements uh, fails. Um, let's uh, look at uh, some of the texts that we have uh, repeatedly uh, mentioned during uh, this week's lectures. So these are excellent references for further reading. Uh, the second volume by Ang and Tang. Uh, it's the first one that I have listed, uh, the, the book by Birolini, uh, the book uh, by Schumann, uh, the system reliability book by Rausend and Holland, uh, and uh, the introductory book by Lewis.